saying hello to all of you and thank you for joining us for day one of Wellbeing Week in Law. The, hi George, the CLA Health and Wellness Committee has uh, worked hard to put together a week of events and discussions centered on various aspects of well-being. Day one today is stay strong, the focus on physical well-being. So part of that, of course, is to eat well. And we are thrilled to have Dr. Clapper here with us today. And I am going to turn it over to my co-chair of the Health and Wellness Committee, Gary Letourneau, who's going to introduce Dr. Clapper. Hey, thank you, Sarah. And uh, it's a pleasure, a privilege, an honor, in fact, to be able to introduce Michael Clapper, medical doctor. Um, in fact, I took a course taught by him to MDs and medical students last year uh, for um, uh, 12 courses, 24 hours, and um, it was an amazing experience. Um, Dr. Clapper is from Chicago. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of College of Medicine in Chicago. And then uh, post medical school, he received um, training in internal medicine, surgery, anesthesi anesthesiology, and orthopedics at the University of British Columbia Teaching Hospitals in Vancouver, and in addition in obstetrics at the University of California in, at, at San Francisco. He has practiced acute care medicine in Hawaii, Canada, California, Florida, and New Zealand. Far more fulfilling to him is his current practice, focusing on health promoting food and lifestyle choices to help people prevent the need for hospitalization and surgery. And listen to this, a longtime radio host and a pilot, Dr. Clapper has served as nutrition advisor to NASA's program for space colonists on the moon and Mars, and on the nutrition task force of the American Medical Students Association. On his website, drclapper.com, visitors can find the latest nutrition information through his numerous articles and videos and learn about his Moving Medicine Forward initiative to promote applied nutrition being taught in medical schools. So welcome, Dr. Clapper. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Gary, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'm so honored and so touched that attorneys are interested in, uh, in healthy living. Of course you are, you're human beings, uh, but that you would open to a presentation from a physician giving cutting edge information. Uh, it's a real honor for me. So uh, it's a full presentation. So let me share my screen and uh, See if we can get host is, you know, the host needs to enable my screen sharing here. So uh, Zoom is pretty compulsive about that. Uh, all right, uh, let's try that one. Yes, okay, and here we go. All right, good. And let's um, play slideshow in the window. And uh, let's hit the little green button there, great and uh, hide the video panel and then hide the floating meeting controls. Ta -da! Okay, can you all see oh, when I'm looking at my title slide here? Nutrition Revolution 2021, the medical, legal, and personal considerations because as uh, important as these issues are, I want uh, the people who are observing this uh, presentation uh, to get information so they can use it to make themselves healthier. Uh, for the past uh, almost three years now, I've been going around to medical schools across North America, Canada, Mexico, uh, in, but in Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. And I've been trying to reach the first, second, third year medical students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains and they think that drugs and surgery are the only treatment for uh, the maladies their patients bring to them. And I tell the young students, look, in pathology class, histology, physical diagnosis, you're going to be learning how to diagnose all these weird and wonderful diseases from smallpox to leprosy. But when you get out into the real world and you open the door of the waiting room of your clinic, the emergency room, surgical outpatient, uh, you're not going to see people sitting there with smallpox and leprosy, thank God. Uh, what you're going to be seeing is a large group of patients with a small group of diseases 
Uh, most of them are going to be um, uh, overweight or clinically obese. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you're going to see clogged arteries showing up as high blood pressure, high lipids, uh, and uh, angina. Uh, you're going to see rampant type 2 diabetes because of all the fat these people are eating or clogging up their insulin receptors and a host of inflammatory diseases affecting all the organ systems, lung, intestines, joints, skin, et cetera. This is Western medicine in the 21st century. But when the erstwhile medical student asked their professors or looks online or in their textbook for the cause of these diseases, uh, um, they run into an obstacle. The problem is they get this answer, etiology unknown. Uh, we don't know the cause of atherosclerosis. We don't know the cause of asthma. We don't know the cause of type 2 diabetes. And I will grant that science has not teased out every last little biochemical mechanism, every last little interaction between genes and enzymes. Yes, I grant that. And yes, we've got a lot more to learn uh, on that front. But to say that we don't know the cause of these diseases uh, is a gross overstatement, understatement, it's just a misstatement. <clears throat> uh, because the problem that presents, and if you don't know the cause of a disease, then you can't cure it. And that reduces the doctor to the manager of chronic disease. We can't cure you, but we'll manage your high blood pressure, we'll manage your diabetes. I know about these students, but I did not go into medicine to manage chronic disease. We to cure people. <clears throat> But if you don't, if you aren't able to treat them effectively, the message you give them every time you see them in the clinic, you're going to be sick the rest of your life. You will never get better. Once, once on insulin, always on insulin. You got high blood pressure, you'll take these pills the rest of your life. What a dismal, hopeless message to give your patients and what an unnecessary and hopeless way to practice medicine. No wonder so many of my colleagues are leaving the profession. And the real crime of this is that that is totally an unnecessary misplaced viewing of disease, of health, of medicine, because the truth is every one of these killer diseases are reversible diseases. Every doctor who practices lifestyle medicine, like I'm going to be sharing with you today, uh, we have dozens and dozens, we have so many patients in our practice that used to be obese, that used to have clogged arteries, that used to have high blood pressure, used to have diabetes, used to have asthma. These diseases are largely reversible with a proper diet and lifestyle. And the patient needs to know this, the doctor needs to know this, and the medical profession needs to know and fully embrace this. Etiology unknown. Really, look at what our patients are eating. <clears throat> I wish someone in medical school had sat me down and said, let's talk about the effects of what the patient's daily diet, especially the American version of it, the standard American diet full of meat and dairy and oil and sugars, what that really does to the person's body who is running it on that kind of fuel. Uh, when I stride up to the microphone to give the students this lecture on uh, what I wish I learned in medical school about nutrition, I tell them I'm going to give you the lecture I wish someone had given me 50 years ago. Well, it's about time that we got real about what food really does in the body. So let's talk about it. You're attorneys, but I'm sure you'll be able to follow the science. If you eat a diet based on whole plant foods, like we are advocating, and I'm certainly advocating with so many of my colleagues, uh, we're talking about a nice colorful salad up in the upper left here, a hearty bowl of vegetable bean soup and dark bread, uh, some quinoa and zucchini boats here, here's uh, some steamed green and yellow vegetables. You eat a meal like this. And if an hour later I were to sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe in my hand, and when you weren't looking, I draw five cc's of blood into a glass tube, let it clot and spin it down the centrifuge, this is what it would look like. The red clot goes to the bottom, the liquid part of the blood, the serum rises to the top, and it's crystal clear. This is what your blood should look like after you eat a meal. You can read newsprint through normal serum. This is uh, how your blood should look like after a healthy meal. But you eat a standard Western meal, you have bacon and eggs for breakfast, you have a cheeseburger and fries for lunch or pizza or chicken for dinner, you eat a meal like this. 
And let's focus on the lunch, the heavy saturated fat in the beef, the butter fat in the cheese, the egg yolk and the mayonnaise on the bun, the vegetable oil and the french fries. All this fat oozes out into your blood. And for the next five, count them five hours, your blood looks like this. This creamy appearance here, this is called lipemia. It means fat in the blood. Postprandial means after eating. And now I grant that not everybody shows it this optically densely, but everybody has a wave of fat that goes to your bloodstream after you eat a fatty meal. How can you not? Where's it going to go? And your blood stays this way for five, count them, five hours. Here's Kuro's classic study. They gave someone a fatty meal at hour zero. They drew blood once an hour for six hours. They took those blood tubes and put them one after another into an instrument that measures how milky the serum is getting. And you can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver a good five hours to begin to clear the fat out of the blood and bend this curve down. And during this time when the blood is running heavily with fat, evil things are happening in the body. Uh, the saturated fats injure the artery walls, opening the way for atherosclerosis. Uh, as the fat flows through the abdominal fat stores, it sticks there, increasing abdominal obesity. Uh, as, uh, as, the, as, as the fat piles up in the liver and muscle cells, it interferes with the action of insulin, opening the door to type 2 diabetes. And this fans inflammatory reactions throughout the body. This is what happens during those five hours. Well, consider how most people run their eating day in the West and the Canadians and the, uh, and the Mexicans and the Australians and the Kiwis and the Brits, everyone eating in the Western style does this. I'm saying a standard American diet, but it's the Western style of eating. They have bacon and eggs for breakfast and egg muffin and all morning, the blood is running thick with fat, injuring their arteries, making them obese and diabetic and inflamed. Takes the liver till about noontime to begin, begin to clear the breakfast fat out of the blood when time for lunch and another way the fat goes through the bloodstream and all afternoon, the arteries are injured, obesity, diabetes increasing, inflammation's going up. Takes the liver till about six in the evening to begin to clear the lunchtime fat out of the bloodstream when time to visit the colonel and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream and all evening, the, the arteries are injured in obesity, diabetes going up, inflammation is going up. Takes the liver till about 10 o'clock at night to begin, begin to clear the dinner time fat out of the blood. When on the way back to the bedroom, we polish off that um, pint of vanilla ice cream and another way the fat goes to the bloodstream. And the truth is most Americans, most Westerners eating in this style are keeping their blood fatty all day. The fat never clears out of the bloodstream. And we do not tolerate hunger in this society. If we get an all munchy sensation, if we're home, we put our head in the fridge for last night's leftovers. If we're out, we head for the convenience store or the restaurant. Uh, we are always in the postprandial state uh, after eating. And we're keeping our blood in this uh, manner pretty much constantly. Now I'm focusing on the fat in the blood, but it's just a marker. The, it's not a manner of, well, don't eat fat. It's just a marker for the effect of how long your meal influences your blood chemistry. There's a lot more in that blood besides fat. This is a high salt diet. There's salt in the prepared meat, salt in the cheese, salt in the fries, salt in the chips. It's, and it's in the restaurant food and the spaghetti sauce at the Italian restaurant, the soy sauce in the Chinese restaurant. Um, it's a high salt diet. This not only stiffens your arteries, makes you retain water and raises your blood pressure, opening the door to strokes and heart attacks. But we now know that the salt turns on a particular type of immune cell that opens the door to autoimmune <clears throat> diseases. <clears throat> Um, then there's sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a half a teaspoon of maple syrup in your tea for flavoring. That's how it's supposed to be used. It's a flavoring. It was never meant to be eaten as a food. And when you eat a donut, a cupcake, a piece of, of chocolate, a, uh, well, dark, a little bit of dark chocolate is okay, but you're eating a full a milk chocolate candy bar um, if you're, and drinking a cola, well, all this sugar floods through your tissues and it sticks to proteins all over the body and your own body heat runs what's called the Maillard reaction. And this is what happens on the surface of 
bread, this is what bread crust is. This is, uh, this is protein, wheat gluten, saturated with sugar and then heated. And it turns into this matted, bastardized, oxidized protein mat, uh, <clears throat> which is fine on the surface of French baguette. It's called advanced glycation end products. Don't worry about the name, but remember the acronym. This ages you because when you drink a cola, you eat that candy bar, you eat that ice cream, you flood your tissues with sugar. They stick to proteins all over the body and your own body runs the Maillard reaction. Uh, and <clears throat> it's fine on the surface of a French baguette, but you don't want to run the Maillard reaction and the lens of your eye protein, that's a great way to give yourself cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction and the elastin fibers of your skin is a great way to, uh, uh, to turn your skin into an old suitcase. You, and you don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the inner lining of the blood vessels in your brain. Um, the inner lining thickens and oxygen can't get across to your nerve cells. And this opens the door to Alzheimer's dementia. In fact, here are blood vessels of two people who died at the same age. This person did not have Alzheimer's. This person did. And, and these were all the damaged arteries from the advanced glycation end products from the sugar eating, the fat eating, uh, all the artery abuse. Now there's a huge vascular component to Alzheimer's. Now, all that I mentioned, the fat and the sugars and the salt, uh, you can do this all on vegan junk food, on, on the vegan chips and the, and, the, and the vegan cakes and the vegan ice creams and the, and the, and the, and the salty, phony uh, uh, meat analogs. Uh, so you don't want to be a junk food vegan. Um, so again, I'm focusing on the salt and the sugar and the fat. But if you add meat to the diet, and most Americans do, they, they eat a meat-based diet. There's a piece of animal muscle in the center of every plate. If it's not there, you say, hey, where's my protein? <clears throat> the very act of, of eating cooked animal muscle sends this wave of toxic molecules through the bloodstream. I could spend the rest of the lecture just on this slide talking about what these uh, molecules do in the bloodstream. Let me quickly run through them. But this is what a meat-based diet delivers to your tissues hour after hour, day after day, year after year. Oxidized cholesterol, nobody eats raw meat. The very act of grilling that chicken breast or broiling that steak, or cooking that burger, oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal muscle. Oxidized cholesterol is highly atherogenic. It, sets, it opens the door to atherosclerosis in, in the artery walls. Um, you uh, roast the chicken breast, you're gonna create a reactive aldehydes that are mutagenic. They mess up your genes and that messes up the enzymes these genes create. That opens the door to cancers and birth defects. New 5GC, this is a cyanic acid that only animals make. And our meat eating friends are giving themselves a shot of New 5GC three times a day. It sets off inflammatory reactions throughout the body and the joints and the arteries and uh, skin. Endotoxin comes from the slaughterhouse. Um, as all animals, even organic grass that beef pass through the slaughterhouse, uh, and as the animals are eviscerated, their gut uh, contents spill all over. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's, uh, every cutting surface in the slaughterhouse is covered with these gut bacteria, Salmonella, Shigella, Clostridia, Enterococcus. And so every steak and chop and chicken breast that leaves the slaughterhouse has a thin coating of these bacteria. Uh, in the meat case at the supermarket, the light shines down on them, the bacteria die. And when, they, and when the bacteria break up, their cell walls release this nasty polysaccharide called endotoxin. This is bad stuff. This uh, sets off uh, uh, blood clotting. It releases histamine, releases free radicals. It depresses the heart function. Uh, and again, uh, and because it's heat stable, cooking the burger does not get rid of the endotoxin. Our, our paleo friends and keto friends are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin three times a day. Not a good thing. TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, this is a molecule from hell 
uh, that drives cholesterol into the artery walls. It's made by the bacteria in your gut summing up by a meat-based diet. And again, our paleo and keto friends are walking around with high levels of TMAO. They will pay the price in strokes and heart attacks down the road. Carcinogenic heterocyclic amines are created by the cooking of animal muscle. Uh, these cause cancer and they rub on the stomach wall setting off stomach cancers. They rub on the uh, colon wall setting off colon cancers. They get into the blood, wind up in the breast tissue, prostate tissue. Uh, a meat-based diet is a pro-cancer diet. IGF-1, insulin like growth factor one. This is a hormone that promotes growth that your liver secretes in response to a high protein diet. When you eat meat and all the amino acids of the meat flood through the liver, the liver responds with a gush of IGF-1. That's fine if you're a growing calf or growing child, but if you're a woman with a breast lump or a guy with a big prostate, that's the last thing you want is a surge of IGF-1 and it turns little breast lumps into big breast lumps. Heme iron, it turns red meat red, sets off strokes and cancers and the red meat eaters get lots of that in their tissues. And finally, the animals in, in the feedlots are fed bushels of grains that are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides and they drink water with cadmium and mercury and lead in it. All this accumulates in the flesh of the animals. And when you bite into that chicken breast or that burger you're eating, all the concentrated pesticides, and herbicides and heavy metals that animal consumed during its life. This is the toxic tide that flows through the tissues after every meat-based meal. It's what I call the postprandial red tide. And, and these are the molecules I just uh, ran down. This, this washes through every cell in your body. It's a, this tide is fatty and salty and sugary and antigenic and acid forming and mutagenic and carcinogenic and atherogenic and inflammatory. And it disrupts you know, chemical reactions throughout the body. This is the reality of the Western diet of a meat and dairy based diet. Now, when a real flood is washing through your house, it's very disturbing to see your sofa float down the street. But what's really upsetting you about having your house flood is what that dirty water leaves behind. That, that flood water uh, seeps into the carpet and the baseboards and the wall structures, and that makes you tear out uh, all the uh, structures uh, that compose your house and the walls, etc. It's the stain that's left behind. Well, that's the problem. With the, uh, with the red tide, it leaves its own kind of biological stain in your tissues. And over time, if you eat three meals a day, that's a thousand times a year, you're flushing the red tide through your tissues. They're essentially always in the bloodstream. And I tell the students, when you open the door in the exam room, you see the man there with the angina and the person with the diabetes injecting insulin and the lady with the, with the acne and the guy with the obesity. These are not random events. These are not bad genes. What you're looking at is the food effects over time it creates the health effects. You're looking at the effects of the red tide, meal after meal, month after month, year after year. And so I turned to my colleagues, uh, the doctors who are recommending paleo diets. Oh, you are eating keto, you are eating keto and paleo. I said, doctor, are you seriously recommending to your patients that they keep these molecules flowing through their tissues, meal after meal, day after day, year after year? Really? <clears throat> because uh, we do that and then the doctors are puzzled. Gee, why did the joints suddenly get inflamed? Gee, why did the skin break out? Gee, where did that plaque in the arteries carrying that blood really come from? Gee, and that colon cancer that sprouted out of the gut wall, gee, yeah, yeah, I know the bad, bad luck, I guess. Doctor, for scientists, how can we disregard this potent, potent force that the, that the patient's inflicting upon themselves three times a day? Now, folks recommending paleo and keto diets say, hey, well, my patients get better. They lose weight and their blood pressure goes down and their diabetes gets better. Paleo is a great diet. And uh, to which I say, do not be seduced by these early beneficial changes. Mm -hmm. um, the paleo diet has a lot of features I agree with. 
Yeah, they say no, no caveman ever milked a dairy cow or crushed uh, the fat out of olives to pour in her salad or, or milled wheat into flour to make donuts. And if you remove the dairy and the oil and the flour products of someone's diet, they're going to trim down, you lose weight. And that alone is going to make their diabetes better and their blood pressure better. Yay. But don't lose sight of the truth of this diet. You are still packing the intestines full of cooked animal flesh three times a day. And I fear these folks are setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer and, and heart attacks and strokes and autoimmune diseases and type 2 diabetes and Crohn's and colitis and dementia. And so these folks that are recommending this and I ask, do you really know what you're doing when you're putting these people on this kind of diet? <laughs> because what, what is this diet really brewing up in this person's colon wall? What is really brewing up in this person's artery, in this guy's prostate gland, in this woman's breast, and all of their brain tissues? And I say, yeah, you're going to be, he's often young docs uh, into, into the paleo and the keto the, uh, philosophies. So you're going to be around in 10 years when this guy passes his first bloody stool from that colon cancer that your, that your paleo diet brewed up in his colon, well, now you're gonna be off to your new luxury clinic appointment in Seattle. You're gonna be around 15 years and this lady has her big old stroke from the carotid artery plaque in her neck that your keto diet brewed up. Yeah, you're gonna be off in Phoenix uh, at, your, uh, at your luxury spa clinic appointment. Uh, this is drive-by medical advice, and uh, the adage we practice by do no harm applies to dietary advice as well. You can hurt somebody with, with bad dietary advice, and I think that's what's happening uh, with these uh, current fad diets. Nobody's eaten a paleo diet for 30 years, 40 years. Nobody's eaten a ketogenic diet for decades. People have eaten plant-based diets for centuries. And if you look at the blue zones, those places on planet Earth where people live the longest, where they're the most centenarians, you find the one thing they all have in common, they all eating a diet based on whole plant foods. Now, let me just say that uh, they're not vegans and they usually have some little bit of animal flesh um, along with a meal once or twice a week. But it's once or twice a week, it's not two, three times a day. Uh, and the vast majority of what goes down their gullet grew out of the ground in a relatively unprocessed form, whole grains, whole legumes, uh, whole fruits and vegetables, along with physical activity and support of family, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so I asked my colleagues, now, if your patients are already on a plant-based diet, and I ask, are they running these toxic molecules through their tissues day after day? The answer is no. My, my, my plant-based eaters don't do this to themselves, and that has huge ramifications. But my profession, my colleagues, we practice medicine like what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases they're bringing to us. We, we regard the patient's diet like in the Harry Potter movies, the Voldemort, the archvillain, ooh, the name that must not be spoken. Ooh, don't ask about the patient's diet. Ooh, that's cultural. Now you'll offend them. We're Americans. We can eat whatever we want. Yeah, we can. But your arteries got something to say about that. Your prostate gland's got something to say about that. Your colon's got something to say about that. And that is the problem when we do not take into account the effect of diet upon diseases. And it's a fatal, tragic over, oversight. Why? Because the biological truth is within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that mouthful of food are flowing through every cell in your body where your DNA lies unfolded where all your genes are exposed, the genes that call for the various enzymes in your, in your, in your biochemistry. And the food molecules flow over your DNA molecules and they play your DNA like a piano. And they turn genes on, they turn genes off. They induce enzymes, they shut enzymes down. In this information age, we can't be shocked when we realize food brings in not only nutrients, it brings in information. Every meal changes us on a genetic molecular level. 
And you don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes that are going to be turned on by this broiled steak with all the, the dysfunctional molecules that flow through the tissues because of it, all the oxidized cholesterol, the 5 c endotoxins, all of that stuff. And the genes they turn on that result in aging, inflammation, autoimmune disease, and cancer, these genes turned on by this stake are going to be a totally different set of genes than are going to be turned on by this salad that floods the tissues uh, with antioxidants, with phytonutrients that quench free radicals, that promote tissue repair, that promote stabilization uh, of the cells. It's the difference between one and zero in computer language, or an animal-based diet versus a plant-based diet. Your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pull the trigger. You may have a genetic propensity in your family to a specific disease, but whether that disease really manifests in your body, largely, largely, not completely, but largely depends on the food you're flowing through your tissues, meal after meal after meal. Here you see it in action. In the left-hand panel here, this is genetic readout of a man with prostate cancer. And uh, these red panels here, these red dashes, these are all actively functioning, they're called oncogenes, they are cancer-promoting genes and that are promoting the growth of this man's early stage prostate cancer. This man goes on a whole food plant-based diet, runs lots of salads and soups and steamed veggies and, and Asian uh, uh, curries through, uh, uh, through his prostate gland, meal after meal. Six months later, they do another biopsy. Same man, same prostate, same genes. Look at what has happened, what the effect of that food has been. Look how many of these red panels are now turned green. They are now turned off as far as cancer promotion goes. This is the power of food. And yet we totally blow past this. We just ignore it. It's important to understand that food changes us. Every meal changes us in one of two ways, uh, either directly uh, called epigenetics, like the way new 5GC turns on inflammation chemically, but also the food we eat changes the bacteria that live in our gut, our microbiome, and they will change us by the molecules they create and put into our bloodstream and into our brain. That's how powerful food is. And when my colleagues practice medicine, like what our patients are eating is irrelevant. It reduces them to the plight of the blind men and the elephant. You've heard the famous fable a group of blind men come upon an elephant. They each grab a different part of the elephant. Uh, the one grabs his tail, the elephant's like a rope. The other grabs its trunk, the elephant's like a snake. One grabs a leg, the elephant's like a tree trunk. They all have hold of the same elephant, but none of them have the faintest clue what a whole living elephant really, really is. Well, that's the problem with doctors who are ignoring nutrition, especially our beloved specialists. They're each tucked away in their cubicles in the specialist building, and the cardiologist sees the clogged arteries, and the internist sees the high blood pressure, and the physiatrist sees the sore joints, and the endocrinologist sees the type 2 diabetes, and the rheumatologist sees the lupus, and the dermatologist sees the psoriasis, and the neurologist sees the dementia, the gastroenterologist sees the colitis, the, gastro the general surgeon sees the colon cancer, and uh, what could be the cause? Hmm, well, they're each trying to tease out the, the mysterious causes of their uh, these conditions. Makes me want to get my loudspeaker and yell into their ear, it's the food they're eating. They're all looking at the same cause. Yeah, but uh, as this toxic food brew washes through the various organ systems, the one that complains the first uh, whether it's the gut or the skin or the joints or the arteries, that determines which specialists they're going to see. But they're looking at the same disease. It's the effect of the Western diet full of meat and dairy and oils and sugars causing damage. I tell the students, when you open the door in the exam room, it's never just you and the patient. It's you, the patient, and the patient's daily diet. That's the invisible sculptor that carves up the inner lining of the arteries and creates the diseases you're seeing. And the real tragedy is that by not recognizing the effect of the patient's diet on their disease state, 
that denies the patient the life-saving knowledge that a diet based on whole plant foods can arrest and will generally reverse these diseases. It's just basic biology. We have to start with the recognition that we are basically plant-eating hominids. We've got basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and our bonobo cousins have, and they're up in the trees eating leaves and fruit. And we're basically designed to eat a similar diet. We've got fingers on our hands, not claws. Then we've got big, long intestines for digesting fiber. We've got small mouths with flat grinding molar teeth to grind up starchy roots and tubers. And we've, in our saliva, we've got enzymes to digest starches, not protein. We're clearly plant-eating hominids. And if we follow, follow that natural law and eat a whole food plant-based diet, we don't generate these dreadful diseases that are killing us and exerting such a great toll upon our society. <clears throat> these are reversible diseases. I went through medicine for 40 years before someone put these two words in the same sentence, disease reversal. I wish somebody had told me about this, that this, is, this should be the goal of what patients can work for. Right? They shouldn't settle for anything less. Now, here I am talking about a whole food plant-based diet. What in the world am I talking about? And you might be thinking, this guy's saying, not the meat. Where am I going to get my protein? Where am I going to get my iron? Um, this, is, this is a dangerous woo-woo California fringe diet. No, it's not. People have been nursing themselves on whole food plant-based diets since the beginning of humans. Uh, and uh, and uh, those of you who need to see the numbers, here's a day of healthy eating. You know, starting off with some oatmeal and fruit with a little uh, almond milk on it. Lunches and dinners and big colorful salads and hearty vegetable soups and sweet potatoes and here's a bean burrito and steamed green yellow veggies and a uh, veggie burger and a and dessert for raspberries with some oat milk on it. You put that through the nutritional analysis program, look at what you get. For just 2,400 calories, very modest amount of calories, you get a whopping 84 grams of protein. That's way more than the government recommends. Um, only 47 grams of fat. This is a healthy diet, complete with everything you need. Uh, though uh, you should be taking a little bit of B12 because uh, we've stopped drinking out of streams and eating unwashed vegetables, which is the actual source of vitamin B12 for our brains. Now, why does it work? I'm telling you that a plant-based diet reverses these bad diseases. How does it do that? Wait, is this just focus, focus, and wishful thinking? Not at all. Here's what to keep in mind. First of all, when you change the whole food plant-based diet, the red tide, that, that molecular assault of every organ, every gene, every enzyme in the body, the entire red, side on, red tide onslaught stops. The, the, uh, the uh, chemical war against your tissue stops. That allows tissue repair to happen. And in its place, Meal after meal, salad after soup, after steamed veggie, after veggie burger, floods the tissues with, first of all, a lot of water. It's a high water content of diets, like taking your cells to a car wash. But it floods the tissues with these uh, antioxidant phytonutrient molecules uh, that uh, generate nitric oxide in the artery walls that dilates the blood vessels. All the water makes the blood less viscous, more free flowing, so that uh, increases oxygen delivery to the tissues. It changes the fat balance in the tissues from uh, pro-inflammatory animal fat, arachidonic acid-driven fats, uh, to the anti-inflammatory omega-3s. As I said, it flows the tissues with antioxidants that neutralize free radicals that stop tissue aging or slow it down. Um, it changes the microbes in the gut to beneficial Prevotella and suppresses the pathogenic uh, bacteria that cause inflammation. The blood lipids get better, skin oils change, acne gets better, your breath gets better, hormone levels uh, uh, normalize. High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. Kidney function gets better on this more moderate protein diet. Uh, lungs breathe easier. It changes everything. I could spend the rest of this lecture and two more talking about the chemistry of how this diet affects and benefits every organ system in the body. Don't have time to do it, but it changes everything. We can't, uh, can't uh, underestimate that.
or overestimated. And, as, and after 35 years of using whole food plant-based nutrition as the, uh, as the center of my uh, nutritional uh, therapy programs, the changes I see are spectacular and predictable. It's just stunning. Within days of adopting a whole food plant-based diet, the obesity begins to melt away. The arteries relax and open up. High blood pressures come down. The insulin receptors open up. Diabetes gets better, goes away. The inflamed joints stop hurting. The asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much. The migraine headaches get better. And they turn into normal, healthy people right before your eyes. All of us who practice lifestyle medicine, you have patients like Emily used to look like this and had diabetes and high blood pressure. 11 months on a whole food plant-based diet, this Emily turns into this Emily. No, normal weight, off her blood pressure medicines, off her diabetes uh, med medication, off her insulin. I tell the med students, what more could you want for your patients that to help them regain their health on the deepest, truest level? And again, all of us who use plant-based nutrition for our uh, nutritional touchstone uh, have dozens and dozens and dozens of patients like Emily. So let me talk a little bit more science. I know a lot of people have type 2 diabetes out there. Here's the mechanism. People say, oh, diabetes and eating too much sugar. No, it's not. It's a disease of too much fat. Uh, here is a muscle cell. Uh, it runs on glucose molecules, sugar in your diet. Uh, and in order for the sugar to leave the bloodstream into the cells, this molecule called insulin from your pancreas uh, has to open up the uh, uh, the glucose receptors and allow the sugar into the cell to be burned. That's how it's supposed to work. But if you keep your blood fatty all day and the fat builds up in the tissue called intramyocellular lipid, it builds up in the muscle, it clogs up the insulin receptors, it inhibits the enzymes. So insulin knocks on the door, but nobody answers and the, and the sugar builds up in the bloodstream. This is not theoretical. This is what it looks like. This is intramyocellular lipid in the muscle cells. Here it is under the electron microscope. This is fat in the cells that are clogging up the insulin receptors. Shouldn't be there. Uh, and there's lots of uh, studies uh, validating this is the main mechanism of insulin resistance. <clears throat> now, uh, this is the most common ways that people open the door to type 2 diabetes, but obesity makes it worse. Why? People are oh, it's okay. You can be fat and be healthy. No, you can't because obesity is a state of inflammation. The abdominal fat wrapped around the intestine puts out these molecules called inflammatory cytokines, and they interfere with the insulin receptors on the outside, while the fat clogs up the insulin receptors on the inside. No wonder so many obese people develop type 2 diabetes. Well, guess what? You get them on a whole food plant-based diet, lots of salads and soups and steamed veggies, and this fat is burned for energy, the, uh, the inflammatory cytokines go away, and the insulin starts working again. And it's a reversible disease. Whistle told me about that. And there are studies showing uh, that they compare a whole food plant-based diet with the American Diabetes Association diet. And the whole food plant-based diet results in more weight loss and better control of blood sugar, better control of, of lipids. Uh, and all of us uh, practice lifestyle medicine. Have patients like Jim used to be 100 pounds overweight, grossly diabetic on insulin, went whole food plant-based, uh, lost all this weight. Now he's running marathons and off all his insulin. Um, diabetes, um, in dermatology, um, it turns out that dairy products, the, the have proteins, lactalbumin, uh, that turn on genes uh, that make the skin oils very acidic and that opens the door to acne. But you yank out the dairy and the oils and the sugars uh, and the animal proteins and skin like this can turn into skin like that. Psoriasis often gets much better. I used to run the other way when people, they came in with psoriasis. Now I've got something to offer them. It's not a hundred percent, you know, that that's the magical cure, but it usually gets much, much better. All these conditions. I'm not saying all you have to do is adopt a plant-based diet, but it's square one. It's the place you start. If you're serious about reversing these diseases, then, then a whole food plant-based diet is, is the baseline uh, that, that allows all the other treatments to work much, much better. And the most important, 
The improvement is shown in cardiology is the state of our arteries, the number one cause of uh, death in, in Western societies every 30 seconds. Someone grabs their chest and falls over the heart attack and dies because the inside of their arteries are filled with these inflammatory plaques of, of oxidized cholesterol uh, called atherosclerosis. The cardiologists say, well, just, just bad genes, their LDL is too high, they all need statins, they all need stents, they all need um, uh, um, bypass procedures. That's right, doctor. Don't talk to them about what they're not, what they're eating. Let them keep eating the standard Western diet. That's exactly what you're going to see. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it's totally unnecessary. A whole food plant-based diet, especially the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and the dark leafy greens, penetrate into these plaques, neutralize the free radicals. The plaques get smaller. The, uh, the atherosclerosis washes away in the blood flow stream. And, and arteries like this, this is the left anterior descent is an artery in the heart with an angiogram filled with dye here. Uh, the entire artery should look about this wide, uh, but this rat-eaten part down here, these are atherosclerotic plaques encroaching into the blood flow channel. This man has such severe angina, he already had a heart attack and had to take in nitroglycerin after walk just a few steps. Man went on a whole food plant-based diet, meal after meal, salad after salad, a veggie burger after veggie burger, whatever. That's symbolic for, for, for a whole food plant-based diet. 22 months of those meals, the plaques melt away and this artery turns into this artery. Same patient, same artery. This is the power of a plant-based diet. <clears throat> and arteries all over the body open up, much to the delight of people at home. Uh, this is in the medical literature. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who did this study, uh, published it. Here's uh, Valley Practice Journal 2014, seven years ago. But he published this in the 1990s and started uh, to get these kind of results. And if you have clogged arteries or know or love anybody who does or any of your clients, please have them get Dr. Esselstyn's book, Prevent Reverse Heart Disease. Follow his program to the, to the letter and uh, you can get these uh, beneficial changes as well. Uh, and again, the very same uh, beneficial diet and lifestyle changes that prevent heart attacks and strokes also will help prevent Alzheimer's disease as well. But yet we just blow right past this in medical school. Doctors are not taught about nutrition. They don't respect nutrition as, as a science. It's not on the national board exams. And they're eating the same food themselves in the hospital cafeteria and the restaurant. Ah, nutrition, ah, send them to the dietitian. I'm up in the OR doing real medicine. But what are they doing up in the OR at three in the morning? They're dealing with the infections and the infarctions and the amputations from what their patients are eating. They're all dealing with nutritional based diseases. And yet, the usual approach to our patient's diet, this powerful, powerful factor, the number one reason that the patient is sitting in front of you, doctor, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up, inflamed is what they're eating. And yet we, we totally ignore it. The, the, and, it's, and it's a oversight of the highest egregious order. The, study, the journals are full of these uh, of articles of studies clearly showing that a plant-based diet benefits high blood pressure, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, that melts away artery disease, type two diabetes, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. They can't say that we don't know anything about this. There's so many studies already in the journals. <clears throat> and we are instructed by the principles of ethics and the American Medical Association says a physician shall continue to study apply and advance scientific knowledge and make relative, excuse me, make relevant information available to our patients. We are mandated to share this with our patients. Withholding this information is unethical. Literally, it's in the statement of ethics and withholding it is unethical. Yet, Never a word do we mention this patient. Oh, you got clogged arteries, or you need a stent tomorrow. The clogged arteries, oh, you need a bypass tomorrow. Sign here. And I think it's just a matter of time, fellow attorneys, <clears throat> not fellow, I'm not an attorney, but, but hear me, you legal 
the servants that you are. I think it's just a matter of time before an angry widow walks into the office of a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon and says, my husband died on that operating table last month during a four vessel coronary artery bypass procedure. And nobody told us he could have melted those plaques away from the inside of his arteries with a whole food plant-based diet. Why was this information withheld from us? Why didn't somebody say something about this? How long have you people known about this? How long has it been in the medical literature? 25 years. Are there, I think there's legal implications to this. If this woman engages an attorney and lodges a wrongful death suit, I think she's got a good case. This is a wrongful death. This is would have been totally preventable if you could melt that plaque away from the inside of a whole food plant-based diet. Why was this information withheld from her? And so we have to really question the whole issue of informed consent. Well, she was not informed of this information that is freely available. It's fully in the medical literature. So we have to have a, through the legal, I have a look at informed consent. What is she saying? Why was that not on the informed consent? You and, and I've been told that as I'm signing permission for this procedure, that this, uh, this uh, condition could be reversed as plaque melted away with a whole food plant based. I've been told that and choose not to, not to take that mode of action. Fair enough, but some, but she had there at least entitled to that information. The doctor said, well, it's not standard of care. We, uh, we don't talk to about patients, what they're eating, that's not standard. We got to have a look at that entire idea. Well, how bankrupt is that? We at least owe the patients uh, the information. And I've given uh, Gary and Lauren uh, the, the handout. I give my patients a four page handout here. Watch these videos, visit these websites, read this article, and, and you'll know what to eat. It's your choice whether you want to follow it or not, but you at least need to know that this effective therapy exists. And yet my colleagues, the surgeons, the endocrinologists, the inter oh, they don't want to hear about this. Um, why? And let's be real. This is a get real type of lecture. First of all, a nutritional approach, it, it doesn't replace that. Some people are going to need surgery. Some people are going to need stent. There are life-saving moments when these procedures are necessary. But, but there are hundreds of thousands of stents and bypasses done every year uh, without talking to the patients about what they're eating and the ability of, of a healthy diet to reverse it, I think is unforgivable. So why are they so resistant? Well, it threatens or it breaks, or at least it supersedes the current medical model. So they can't claim etiology unknown. We have a, and, and gee, we're, the, the smart uh, researchers are looking for that magic molecule and they'll make a mesocillin and we'll give it to our patients and, and uh, reverse these diseases. But till that happens, uh, there's nothing we can do. We've got to do these invasive procedures. Nonsense. So they're, they're, they don't want to give up their, their pills and procedures and the vain hope and more funding uh, to search for mesocillin. Second, it threatens and it actually breaks and supersedes the current treatment model. It means you got to pull the plant-based dietitian onto the treatment team and let her or him counsel the patient first for a few weeks before you, um, you, you put them on the insulin and the metformin and, uh, and place the stent. And finally, it threatens or it breaks or it supersedes the current financial molecules. And that's sort of a huge, huge driver to their resistance. Because now we just pay for doing things to people who already have the disease. And, but if you can reverse the disease just by their diet, ooh, a whole lot of the cash cows are going to wander out to pasture there. Well, what do I say about that? A Latin phrase you probably ran into in law school, fiat justitia of ruet silum, let justice be done though the heavens fall. There's plenty of money in the system. We just got to change the way it's flowing. The bean counters have to change the way the beans are flowing. That's all that's really required here. Well, who's that? How can we do that? Well, here's one. Uh, Ken Beck, plant-based insurance actuary, uh, and uh, he and his colleagues have devised actuarial patient value model reimbursement. There's value to society for every CEO that doesn't go down with a heart attack. 
Uh, he, the company keeps running, those employees keep paying taxes, the, the good work is being done, there's value to that. And Mr. Beckman told me at a meeting, look, Doc, for every coronary artery bypass we don't pay for, we're sitting on a quarter million dollars. We'll be glad uh, to give the, the doctor 20,000 for keeping his patient healthy, we'll give the patient 20,000 for staying healthy, and we're still sitting on $190,000. Um, there's, we've got to change the way the money flows to reward people for staying healthy and, excuse me, for doctors and healthcare professionals to, uh, uh, to promote that. It can be done. We just got to uh, look at medicine uh, in a more, more positive light. I tell the docs, before you order another $1,000 scan, another $500 set of blood tests, stop. Ask your patient what they eat every day. And that's probably, if they're full of burgers and buffalo wings, that's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor, all hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed. Send the patient to the dietitian, let her do her magic and see them back. Because they're, well, people don't change what they eat. They do change. Not everybody, heavens knows, they gotta be ready. But more and more people are getting ready. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. My patient, Ken, came in looking like this, on blood pressure and insulin medicines. 12 weeks on a whole food plant-based diet, dropped 25 pounds off his meds off his uh off his insulin uh, for what price you ordered the bean chili instead of the beef chili you know that's the huge sacrifice but it makes all the difference in the world it's time to leave caveman thinking behind it's already happening in academics here's uc davis and their uh plant-based uh course uh, here's kaiser in california and other places um, telling their doctors about plant-based diets. They know they're going to save so much money if their patients go plant-based. Now, how about you? If you have clogged arteries, if you're on insulin or metformin, if you're overweight, how do you get started? It's not too late. It's not too difficult. It's delicious food. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Asian stir fries and Indian curries and Mexican chilies and hearty vegetable stews and soups. Um, go to, uh, you need to see this film called Forks Over Knives. Go to forksoverknives.com. Uh, the fork is your dinner fork. The knife is a scalpel opening up your chest. Believe me, take the fork over the knife. Um, and after you see the film and you see all these people getting healthier with healthy eating, uh, then go back to their website and they've got recipes and transition plans. It's not hard. Uh, get this book called Nourish uh, by Dr. Shah and Dietitian Davis, and they will walk you through the steps, how to raise kids, how to do healthy pregnancies on plant-based diets. Go through my handout. You'll see lots of resources and videos and websites to visit. Uh, go to PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, uh, and they'll send you in your inbox your, their, how to do their 21-day kickstart. And you don't have to be completely vegan, but get the meat eating down to a couple times a week, not a couple times a day. And I mentioned plant-based dietitians. They're everywhere. Here they are uh, in Connecticut, and Houston, Texas, Ann Arbor, Michigan, America. These are all med schools that I've lectured at. I find out who's in their local area. Uh, you're there in San Diego. Um, they're, they're, these wonderful professionals are just waiting to do this counseling for the doctors. I don't know anything about it. You don't have to. These people will do the counseling. You just see them back and make sure they're healthy and get ready to lower or discontinue their medicines because that's what you'll see. Educate yourself. Go back to this slide and go to every one of these websites. There's a whole education waiting for you there. Uh, and you can take the course, uh, the six-week course in plant-based nutrition from the University of Winchester in the UK. Wonderful course, highly recommended. Take my course and master class in plant-based nutrition um, for the young docs. Uh, PCRM is offering evidence-based eating patterns for weight control, diabetes, heart disease, free for the taking. The information's out there. It's unforgivable to, uh, to say, oh, we don't know anything about this. Seek and you shall find. Uh, here you can download it all on your cell phone and you'll know uh, what, to, uh, what to eat when these people have these various diseases. Uh, there's doctors doing this full time. Here's my friends at Rochester Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, here's the Plantrition Project folks in their conference. Thousands of doctors from around the world are practicing this kind of medicine. Uh, you can't say this is new woo-woo fringe stuff. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine has thousands of members promoting this kind of diet and lifestyle. They say, look, once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. 
So we're getting to the end of this. And, I, and it's here I ask the med students a provocative question. Knowing that most of these killer diseases that are gonna take up the majority of your professional careers are reversible with a whole food plant-based diet and a healthy lifestyle, gotta ask you, you wanna heal these people or don't you? Really, why are you going into medicine? So I'll ask my legal colleagues here, could the legal profession step up and help my profession grow into this, into so to reap the benefit of this powerful, powerful knowledge? Could a timely letter from an attorney's office to that cardiovascular surgeon and doctor, you're, you should know that the patient who had unsatisfactory outcome consulted us about, about lodging legal action against you, decided not to do it, but uh, we urge you uh, in your future counsel to include in your informed consent uh, the, uh, the possibility of reversing this disease through plant-based diet and resources to refer this patient to for them to check it out and make an informed decision. Boy, I'll tell you, if I got that letter from an attorney, it would certainly start changing uh, the advice I give my patients. And it might be the magic fairy dust that gets, that gets these wheels turning, sorry for the mixed metaphor here, but it might be what, believe, believe me, we doctors listen to legal threats and it might really help us open our minds and hearts to this very important essential knowledge. So whole food, plant-based nutrition, this truly is an idea whose time has come and it's gonna bring benefits to all of us, to our communities, certainly to my profession. It'll benefit your, your profession to know about this and it'll benefit you uh, to so you stay out the clutches of people like me. Uh, so um, you can find more information on my website. Again, get uh, this wonderful book and learn about it. So this is the nutrition revolution in 2021. The medical aspects, the legal aspects, and the personal ones. Uh, I know it came at you pretty thick and fast, but hopefully uh, you got the general idea. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing here. I have time to... Uh, to answer questions. And if you have any, if anybody's still there, I see we've lost a few folks. But uh, if uh, anyone yep. likes to ask questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks Dr. Pepper, there were a couple in the chat, but if anybody here live would like to, um, you know, chat, raise your hand and I will uh, call on you to ask Dr. Clapper a question. But one of the questions, Dr. Clapper, was what are your views on consuming seafood? Um, I wish I could tell you it's a wonderful idea. It's not. Um, the uh, the, the fish and especially the bottom dwellers, the clams, lobster, etc. they are so full of mercury and pesticides and, and PCBs. We've really been treating the ocean like a sewer and, and the creatures who live in it have, uh, have taken it uh, up in their tissues. Plus, um, as I mentioned, high protein diets are injurious to the kidneys and we are strip mining the oceans. We are clear cutting and we're scooping all the life out of the ocean. It's time to let the oceans heal. We've used, we've used fishing up and uh, it's time to let the oceans heal. And it's contaminated stuff. Don't be eating fish anymore. Okay. And then I believe Breeze has a question for you. She's got her hand raised. Can you see me or hear me? E there, now I can see you. E. We can okay. hear you and see your chin just fine. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I can't see myself. Oh, so I there don't you go. Know. Now we've got you. Oh, you can see me. Okay. So um, excellent lecture. As always, thank you, Dr. Clapper. I want to address this to my fellow attorneys. Um, I have quite a, an extensive uh, practice back in Florida of doing plaintiff's medical malpractice litigation. And one thing that I know is that uh, while Dr. Clapper is, of course, correct that, that um, doctors are concerned about lawsuits, the pressure on doctors comes from their insurance companies. And what insurance companies, medical malpractice uh, companies are concerned about, of course, is not paying claims. So uh, to inspire insurance companies, to inspire their insureds, including hospitals, by the way, which also have guidelines for the doctors who are admitted to practice in those hospitals, uh, in order to, to inspire them to give full informed consent uh, to include these lifestyle changes that can cure or reverse these diseases, um, I think the legal community needs to promote 
uh, I'm sure it would probably, under the rules of ethics, need to be pro bono, um, a test case, a lawsuit on behalf of that widow that Dr. Clapper mentioned um, against that physician who failed to provide in the informed consent information uh, that, that a lifestyle change could reverse the heart disease. And I'm interested in offering my services pro bono to do that. However, I am semi-retired. I'm a member of the California and Florida Bar. I do not have an office. I do not have a secretarial staff. So if there is an attorney out there with a full-fledged practice that could support uh, um, logistically and economically uh, such a lawsuit, um, I would be interested in knowing about that and, and perhaps working with them. And I'll just add that the greatest, the biggest, by far the biggest expense in a medical malpractice lawsuit is paying experts. And in this particular case, uh, there are a lot of medical experts who have a vested interest in participating and perhaps they could even be inspired to do so as experts uh, pro bono as well. So such a suit wouldn't break the bank um, of, a, of a law firm. So if anybody's interested in that, I will put my email in the chat and they can contact me. Thank you. Yes, that's what needs to happen. That's how we start get, making progress. Thank you, sir. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, they're putting some, something in the pot there for us to work with. Thank you so much. The, yeah, bravo, yeah. Maurice. That, that was terrific. Thanks. Great. My pleasure. Okay, next question, Dr. Clapper, is sodium and plant-based diets, is there a connection? So, for example, some veggie burgers are high in sodium. Does this not matter because it is a plant-based product? So, in other words, is the sodium or the meat, the co you know, cause of hypertension? So, can you discuss that a little bit? Thank you. Very perceptive question. Uh, notice the, the description that I give to this eating pattern is whole food plant-based diet. And whole foods means foods in the form that they grew out of the ground. Ah, that's a cucumber, that's a tomato, that's an ear of corn. As long as you're eating that, it's going to be a naturally low sodium diet. Now, as soon as you start processing the foods and doing things and turning the proteins into veggie burgers, yes, they, they add a lot of sodium to that and absolutely it can be a, a high sodium uh, meal. Now, if you've got normal blood pressure uh, and, uh, and have no illnesses, um, a, 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 the occasional high sodium meal uh, is not terrible. You know, we, again, we, we, in the Italian restaurant, you go out, not, nothing usually bad happens. If you've got high blood pressure, you don't want to be messing around with those. Um, so, but the general caution from that lesson is uh, these processed foods, they're delicious, these veggie burgers, but they're a treat. Uh, they're once a month, uh, have a veggie burger. Don't be eating this on a daily basis. That does become a high sodium uh, intake and, and that will lead to, to bad places. But it's a little treat food once a month. Uh, if you've got normal blood pressure, it's not a terrible thing, but it's a, uh, it's a reminder to eat whole foods uh, as nature made them. And, and then the sodium will, will not be a problem. All right, thank you. Okay, one of our um, health and wellness committee members, her mother has been having GI issues and was seeing a UCLA GI specialist going through, of course, all the procedures, trying to figure out what's going on. And she found out that that same department has a nutrition counseling program, but the doctors never referred her to the program. So she's wondering, would it make sense to write a letter to the department just to tell them like your systems are not connecting and you know, Absolutely. What a, what a wonderful, that's exactly what needs to happen. We need to rail the cages and shake the trees and ask and you shall receive. And mm -hmm. these doctors need to get a, a, a statement, a request directly from the patient. How about sending me to the dietitian? Now, many dietitians associated with a large establishment organization uh, often mouth the, the usual uh, dietary advice given to them by the meat and dairy based uh, associations, you know, oh, you take the skin off the chicken, but you know, I have three glasses of milk a day and all of that. That's not whole food plant-based nutrition. And those dietitians are slowly morphing into the, the plant-based ones, but not all the dietary advice you're going to get from the UCLA 
or, or um, you know, the university dietitians might be the most beneficial, but at least put it in the doctor's head, send me to the dietitian. You could talk to the dietitian about the best version of it, but absolutely uh, uh, put that in front of the doctors, make that request. They, it's embarrassing that they didn't make that before, but that's the problem, that's the problem. Right, that's spot on to what you've been discussing. Okay, when somebody right at the top said, in physician standard of care guidelines, is there any mention of lifestyle medicine? Uh, it depends on uh, which which specialty, the cardiologist versus the, the, the pulmonary folks, whatever. They each have their different standards of care, but by and large, I haven't read them all, but I, I suspect not. Uh, again, it's just not on the radar screen, and it's, it's embarrassing for scientists. Uh, to not to take this into account. I, I'm, I'm really embarrassed for my profession at this point, but that's what this, uh, the purpose of our, our gathering is today. But uh, no, it's not generally mentioned. Okay, and then this is an interesting one. If you don't want to be vegan, how much and what type of animal foods would be reasonable, if any? So if you don't think maybe you can be 100%, what would be your recommendation on how to approach that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, it's not a great sacrifice to order the pasta primavera with vegetables instead of the pasta with the meatballs. Uh, you know, you start with the food you already like and then you can veganize them. Uh, order the veggie burger instead of the beef burger, order the, uh, uh, the, the bean chili instead of the beef chili. Just start making those substitutions and it becomes really, really easy. And if you are going to be eating, you know, specifically want some flesh on your plate there, make it the smallest amount. Don't order a 16 ounce porterhouse uh, steak there. You, know, you want you know, a little bit of shredded meat of some sort on the side of your, of your veggie stir fry there or mixed in with, a, with your salad or whatever. But we're talking about three ounces. That's the size of a deck of playing cards once or twice a week. And, uh, but the majority of the meal, in fact, all the meals should be whole food plant-based. They, they should all have salads and soups and steamed veggies, et cetera. But if on two or three of those meals during the week, you want some animal flesh, okay. But people find eventually they, they fade out of the diet. They order it less and less, but yeah. So three ounces, a couple times a week and, and pick your poison as far as which meals you want them in. Okay, great. And um, someone was asking if you work with health coaches, when you are working with your patients? Is it a, you know, a sort of a group effort? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Well, this wonderful new profession, if you will, called health coaches has emerged and thank heavens for them. Uh, these are often, these are people who have just been trained in the coaching profession, but a lot of them are other dietitians. I've got a bunch of health coaches who are registered nurses who've had it with hospital medicine, but they want to still stay in the healing profession. So they've become health coaches and they're wonderful. They're, they're knowledgeable. They can answer the questions uh, for the client, the patient, uh, but also uh, they act as motivation. If the patient knows I've got an I got to answer to my health coach next week about what I've been eating and how much I weigh. Oh boy, that's a, that's a good motivator. And so these health coaches uh, are really the man's the secret sauce, if you will, that makes this all go. Thank heavens for the health coaches. And because it does, we don't have time to do this. And even the registered dietitians, they don't have time to, to really attach themselves to one patient and stay with them, but the health coaches do. So yes, I'm, I'm a big fan of the health coaches and invite people to get involved uh, through that avenue. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful discipline. All right. Well, unless anybody else wants to raise their hand, I, oh, Gary, you've got, come off mute. Um, you, uh, Dr. Clapper, you mentioned Kaiser Permanente in a very positive light. And I've been a member of Kaiser for countless years. I won't mention how many <laughs> in San Diego. And um, my personal experience is 180 degrees different. Um, they have a, a positive reputation, I think, because of a pamphlet published by one physician who's from the Philippines. And, and most doctors have no knowledge at all. What are you talking about? And some of them, my experience is the younger ones may be open to listening and hearing, but they don't know any more about it than the guy walking around the street. And they yes. love to give... Pills, yeah, my, surgeries, that's what they live on. 
period. So it's a misplaced, it's an, in my, my personal opinion, it's an inaccurate perception of Kaiser. Correct, uh, and that's a valid critique. Um, when, when it finally dawned on the executive branch of Kaiser how much they would save if, if even 10% of their patients went plant-based, they would save billions, literally. Um, and so uh, Dr. Tuso and, and others in the uh, executive uh, really pushed this uh, on their uh, uh, the staff. Unfortunately, uh, it did not trickle down to the uh, to the line doctors. When you walk into the primary care clinic, the docs down there never heard about it. And uh, and as a result, Kaiser's continuing to lose money uh, doing all sorts of scams and stents and and bypasses that, that are unnecessary, but it costs right out of, of Kaiser's bottom line every time they crack a chest. Uh, unnecessarily, they are losing money, and they and they still the, the old ways die hard. Unfortunately, it's been a real disappointment. I had real hopes for Kaiser, but again, if the, if the patients demand it, they ask for it. If they say, "What happened to your plant based program?" Uh, and I want to enroll in it. If if they start getting those requests from the patients walking into the front desk, and it trickles up there, uh, who knows? They may uh, they may start seeing the light again. Yes. Uh, just, a, no, just a follow up comment. Uh, I did find a doctor uh, who is an advocate of whole food plant based nutrition, and he has 2000 patients. He's part time. And it's just, you know, it's un, it's unreasonable. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Yes, no, he should then, refer, there should be the plant-based dietitian who really does the, that he can refer to that does the counseling even out of network. But no, the doctor doesn't do the actual counseling. He just needs to have the awareness. I'm that overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, inflamed person is from what they're freaking eating. And they need to change that. So how can we help them do that? Well, refer them to the plant-based dietitian. That's how it should work. And Kaiser's foolish for, for, for not to, taking advantage of this very powerful mechanism. And it's costing them both in patients' lives as well as bottom line income. Uh, we need to change that. There's so much work to do, but it starts with the gatherings like this. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's great to have you with us. It was we a wonderful presentation. Much. Thank you so much, Dr. Clapper. So much information and, you know, uh, um, valuable, valuable information for us. Oh, I'm so to thank you for being open to this. It's so hopeful to have attorneys interested in this. And, and who knows what sparks got ignited here and ran. Like uh, Breeze uh, mentioned, maybe someone will help him actually lodge this suit. It might just take one or two suits uh, or legal actions and hit the headlines and rattle through the medical journals that suddenly the you know, Kaiser wakes up. And uh, that might be what it takes. And so in a way, ball's kind of in your court. Of course, it's, it's our, my profession's issues. But boy, you, you could, guys could really come to the rescue on your white horses uh, with some appropriate legal maneuverings here. So I hope you, know, you take us up on that invitation. They really need you. So thank you very much. Again, save your own lives. If you can't save my profession. Uh, start eating plant-based at least 90% of the time, and you'll stay out of the clutches of people like me and live long, healthy, happy lives. That's what I wish for you all. So thank you for the invitation. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. See you all later in the week.